Hey, all right. Hello, guys. I am here Friday night here in Florida. And I appreciate everybody uh, coming by. We'll get ourselves started here. I'm getting a little bit better every week. So I just put up video today. It's been a while. I've been getting a lot of complaints that I put out videos. But that's okay. <clears throat> been working a lot on the... Uh, the uh, conference that's com that's uh, coming up next year, I just put a, put all the information there, and uh, uh, working with my dad on things, and of course, always looking out for things to be talking about. So, uh, be waiting for people to be joining here. So, and today we have. I don't really have a topic that I thought of because I spent most of my time looking and talking about the, the topic I talked about today, which was the uh, uh, article on, um, what was it? Sorry, it always takes a little time to warm up here, but it was an article on the uh, universes, which was really totally bizarre. So let me get over here. Let's uh, make sure everything's good. Yep, and it says live here. Oh, I got three people watching. Thanks for coming by. So, uh, I've got the chat here. There we go. And... <laughs> Didn't get a bell notification. Yeah, I think you, you know what happens is you got to sort of like do it every time, but... Um, there's there is a bell notification that I noticed because I have lots of uh, different logins for uh, people I, I I help out with, <clears throat> and when I go in and I look at this, it's like oh okay you gotta uh, set an alarm and it will tell you, but a lot of times though if you're subscribed it will come up and tell you that it's uh, actually up and going. I know that's what I got, and. Uh, there's also the red ball on it, but uh, like I said, I hadn't done a video for a while, so I made the uh, video on the uh, universe today, the one article that was just out of this. Hard, hard to believe that these things are actually uh, um, things that people write and put in magazines or put on websites and blogs, so anyways. <laughs> Got my LA t-shirt on today. Spent a lot of time in LA, but it was a good time, but it's time to move on. So, if you guys have any questions, you just feel free to ask. I think I've got everything set up today. I've got my uh, browser. And actually I have, yeah, here's my browser. And I wonder if I can see if I can do this. Oh, no, that's not good. That's not good at all. But this is uh, already getting ready for our, our uh, conference next year. Now, that's somebody actually worth talking about. I think I probably mentioned before uh, Mr. Jack uh, Jackson Pollock, the painter. No, Gerald Pollock. Uh, he discovered a fourth state of water, which is pretty cool. But uh, um, he's going to be our keynote speaker next year. So if any of you are out on the West Coast, we're going to be up in northern, so in Seattle area. It's definitely worth coming because you really get to hang out with people all, all week. Well, half a week. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, Saturday. Uh, a lot of us leave Sunday, but we're usually there for the four days. And um, we will be, you know, we talk about all kinds of stuff. So, anyways. Okay. So, um, as people start gathering here, it usually takes a few minutes. But if you haven't uh, seen <coughs> or heard about uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Pollock, then... Uh, Definitely somebody to look up and, and start reading about. Question, have you been able to view Mars? I could not get over last how clear it was. 
Yeah, it was funny. Uh, yeah, it was. It's beautiful down here in Florida. You can see it. A lot of people think that's like a <clears throat> UFO or something. I remember uh, speaking with a couple of people. And they didn't even know that you could see planets. So we, you know, that happens. But the planet that you can see easily and identify as Mars because of the red. But uh, oh, it's interesting actually. Uh, speaking of Mars. And that is, let's see if I can do that. I'm going to move off here so I can then uh, go and find it. But um, let's see if I can find that YouTube video. I don't know um, if how many of you really looked really closely at uh, Neil Adams. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen his videos. If you haven't, you must see them. But um, one of them he talks about is Mars. And he talks about expansion tectonics on Mars. And that's pretty darn cool. Let's see here. Yeah, there we go. Two minutes, Spirit Series growing. Yeah, this one here. Let's see. Whoop. I'll let this pass. Get this off of there. We've got advertisements flying on us from all the elections coming up. <clears throat> oh, man. YouTube's got more stuff all the time here. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to move around here. Wait a minute. That's not the one. I was supposed to see Mars. That ain't Mars. There we go. So um, this is pretty cool. So speaking of Mars, if you haven't seen this, this is Neil Adams, a guy uh, makes these who made these great videos in around middle of 2000s and uh, let me go to the browser here and show you uh, that Let's see here put it there so you can see it and I believe you're gonna be able to hear it so I'm gonna turn it here go here make sure the volumes up <coughs> and let's play it so uh, this is, if you don't know, the Earth expansion, expansion tectonics. One of the things about expansion tectonics is that people only think it's applicable to... Um, are you guys hearing me okay? Let me see here. It's only applicable to the Earth, so... Let me uh, show you, okay? For our purposes. The colors from NASA are not true. The colors represent heights, tectonic heights. The highest land is red, down the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. The lowest, newest land is blue. Why do I say newest? Because the upper higher land pulled apart and revealed the underland. Call it the newer land. Why newer and how do I know? Actually, all scientists know. Look at the craters. As time goes by for the older land, you get more and more accumulation of craters. This higher red and orange land is older with lots more craters. This green to blue land is newer with far fewer meteor craters. So it's younger. This is the Vales Marineris. I've focused on it because it's the greatest, deepest, and newest rifting and spreading on Mars. This rift is as wide as the United States, but you see, as Mars grew, this rift pulled apart all around. This pulling away made a big circle of pulling apart. The relief of this spreading that made this possible is the young, new, blue area. So quite simply, to go back in time, we close back over this blue, young area, and the upper plates will tighten back around this upper veils area and even the Marinaris will close. The blue young area disappears, covered by the older land. Now we can go forward in time as Mars grows up to today. The blue opens and the land tugs and some pieces break off into, well, islands if there was water. There is no other way that this plate area could come to this configuration unless Mars grew. Thank you.
like I'm talking and there's no voice. I, I had that m m muted. Sorry, folks. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. I am muted. Sorry about that because I muted it so that I didn't have the feedback from it. But um, let me go back and say what I was saying. Uh, <clears throat> and that is, um, if you look back here, let's look back at the very beginning here. I'll stop it. You'll see this trench here that looks very much, it's bigger than the Grand Canyon on Earth, but it's on Mars. One of the things about that is that, for instance, the Electric Universe, some of those people who look into catastrophism say that it was done by electric discharges. Uh, whereas people who are uh, like myself, expansion tectonicists, or believe in expansion tectonics, or subscribe to that theory, uh, we do uh, look at this as m more of a happening of spreading uh, than it does from um, some type of scarring. But in this case, this is Mars, and if you watch it, he's going to uh, do some graphics and close this up. And you're going to see this whole thing just sort of close up. He's look, uh, showing you the colors of the heights. The heights the being uh, um, blue is the lowest and orange being the highest. And what he's saying here is that the older stuff has a lot more pot marks, that there's a lot, of more, a lot more craters there, whereas you can see craters on the uh, areas that are younger, there are less craters. And you keep moving even further and you can uh, see in the green area there's a lot less so um, again that's the idea again there's a, a lot less cratering and if you look at his reformation of the of putting uh, how do you say taking the graphics and sort of uh, simulating the expansion in reverse so it's contracting you'll see this really close up it's pretty pretty quiet quiet it's quite amazing to see how it really does just sort of um, fit together. So uh, I guess they did some uh, techniques of, of, you know, uh, you can do it in 2D where you, you take pieces of this and you can move it. But look at that. That's pretty darn amazing. And if you look at the heights as well, they all seem to light up. This That's pr pretty darn amazing. So... Um, I thought uh, since uh, we were talking about Mars a little that we would uh, take a look at that. Alrighty. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. But if you haven't seen that, you want to take a look at all Neil Adams stuff. Pretty nice. Photo X to the main. <coughs> So I did, like I said, I put out this uh, a video today. I wonder if I can find about those, uh, those, uh, let's see here. I think when I do these videos, I get, uh, get all my uh, energy out on those videos. And I said, you know, maybe it's going to be a mistake making a video on the same day as I do my live stuff. <laughs> but uh, let me see here if I can get the links here. There we go. Um, I do uh, want to do this. This is what I want to do here. I'm going to be making a video of this, but I can start to talk about it already. And that is one of the things what we're looking to do is to, in our website, is to uh, show people the problems with mainstream science and then also uh, showing that things that are not working well. Uh, and why and some evidence against it so I'm going to show you this which I did show in my video today which is this cosmic expansion expansion versus galactic density uh, <clears throat> what this really means is that um, they're looking at the the density of the gal the galaxies that they see and then they try to uh, see of, of the distribution and the density of those if that in fact uh, adds up to something that is cosmic expansion, you know, the expansion of the universe, or not. <clears throat> I did read this today. Uh, again, this is more some of a repeat of what we were doing, but um, uh, he uh, uh, talks about, he talked about this and gave a talk on this. In fact, I'm sure I can actually find that as well. I wonder if I can do that. Hold on. Da, 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 da. Absolutely, I can. 
I'll go to YouTube because we did all this live. Okay. Go to YouTube. Uh, YouTube. Dot natural philosophy.org and that gets me us to the CMPS website and I'll get to the let's see playlists now I can go to my browser uh, CMPS 2018 I don't want to play them all let's go down here there it is. And oh look at this. This is sort of nice. But um we can little listen a little of this. It'd be one of the five or six members here who have been to all now have been to all four of the uh, Chappelle Natural <laughs> Philosophy Society conferences. First one was in 2015 down in Boca Raton. Then we were near the University of Maryland, which are the two dominant theory. Obviously, I mean, the mainstream has and this type of stuff. Those who know me know that I don't really have any of my own theories. I like to look at other people's theories and then try to do the, my little simple mathematicals, mathematics to see if they're plausible or not. And so the first paper is going to be Cosmic Expansion versus Galactic Density. The steady state versus the Big Bang, which are the two dominant theory. Obviously, I mean, the mainstream has long since put the Big Bang on a pedestal, but there are still those who will advocate the steady state, though they'll never get published in any mainstream journals. Observing galactic density with the increasing distance and correspondingly earlier times given the time travel of light should provide evidence as to whether a steady state, non-expanding, or Big Bang driven expanding universe is the more defensible cosmology. So my thought was to simulate galactic densities for both cosmological models. And while I was doing this, I came across some work that had been done by Yuri Heyman. And there's a couple of references here for his work, which I highly recommend if you're interested in this topic, you take a look. And I even corresponded with him and uh, shared some ideas with him. And this is, uh, this is his dominant theory here called the dichotomous cosmology. A universe where the material world is static and the luminous world is expanding that reconciles the static universe of Einstein with <coughs> observations of the expanding universe. And if you're interested, again, Here's the reference for our Yuri Haven's work. If the universe is expanding, then we would expect that the galactic density back in time, that is at the greater distances, should be larger than it is closer in time at the nearer distances, because the universe theoretically is more compact. Okie dokie. Um, that's really uh, pretty interesting. So basically what he's saying is that if you have a Big Bang, you're going to have all these things. And as they spread out and expand, they should not, in fact, be uh, the same density. They should be getting less density, right? You explode uh, anything. What happens is you get less and less as it moves away. The density of that should uh, be different. So that's what he's talking about there. However, and this is what actually Main Street has been reporting, the teams are finding that the number of galaxies per unit of volume of space drops off smoothly with increasing distance. And this is an article, Hubble finds most distant primeval galaxies. And there's a reference there if anybody's interested in that. Contrary to another quotation from uh, mainstream, the expansion of the universe means that objects that were very close together at the time they emitted the light that we're now seeing are spread out over a sky in a way that wouldn't happen in a universe that wasn't expanding. And that was an article titled, Why Does the Apparent Density of Galaxies Drop Off at Larger Distances? And as usual with mainstream, when things don't align with their theories, they come up with patches it's like cosmic inflation. They, they allow the speed of light to be exceeded when they need it to be and never at any other times. And that's 
I mean that those of us here are you know, familiar with the way mainstream operates and since we question it, we like to look for alternate explanations. So my effort focused on two sets of simulations. I randomly placed 100 galaxies over a square area and I worked in two dimensions rather than three just for a visual and calculational convenience and see if the, conclu the conclusions would apply equally to three dimensions. For my no cosmic expansion simulation, the steady state I chose a six by six grid. So what he's doing is he said he's going to be, uh, if you look in his paper, uh, let's just go down here and look in his paper. You're going to see what he's doing is he's making a two dimensional plot of where galaxies would be and then say, okay, if the, if we, as we look out from the center, are we getting, you know, less? If this was a Big Bang, then what we should be seeing is more here and less here. We shouldn't be getting uh, an, uh, an average uh, number of galaxies in uh, that's more evenly distributed. So that's what he's saying. Let's see if I can get ahead of that. Okay. 36 square random units. For cosmic expansion, the Big Bang simulation, I started out with two by two or four random units, and then I could grow it, eventually going out to six by six because I have to expand my universe for that simulation. Within each, I place a circle whose diameter matches the sides of the square, basically just filling the circle in there, and determine how many of the hundred simulated galaxies fall within the circle. And this is a diagram of what I did for the non-expanding steady state universe simulation. This is my six by six grid. The dots represent the 100 galaxies randomly spread throughout there. I just used a random number generator for the locations. And I had uh, three sets of rings here because these are actually, I'm gonna use these for comparison later for the uh, Big Bang expansion. And I ran five sets of simulations and I counted, I just counted up the number of, for each simulation, I counted up the number of galaxies that fell within each of the rings. And what I show here is one of the five simulations. This is the results for the <coughs> sneak previews. This is the results for the, for, from the simulation results for the ones shown in red here. And as it turns out, stop that. What I label here, you'll see anything outside the third ring. Anything outside the third ring, I labeled as not observable because I'm right at the center here as the observer. This is the simpler case. It involves observation and expectation at just one point in time. Since it's Since it's accelerating, you can see with the arrows that, that it actually gets wider and wider at an increasing rate. For the expanding universe, the case is more complex since each simulation must represent a different time, starting from the most compressed universe at time zero, which is to the far right. So basically what he's doing is he's now calculating one for just the steady state and versus the uh, the Big Bang and see and, and looks to see if in fact uh, we have uh, some clue as to whether or not he's first just simulating it. Then he's going to say, well, what do we observe and what does that match? So basically that's that's what he uh, was talking uh, talking about in his uh, and let's get to the conclusion here. Let him get to the conclusion. Quite dramatically. Whereas trying to make this one observable ones out, that's shown by this bottom straight line here and the open circles. The expanding ax universe axis shows that as I go further back in time, greater distance moving to the right, so the galactic density is much higher earlier in the universe than it is at an intermediate and current time. 
So neither, but neither one of them shows the expectation of some sort of decrease, which is what, again, the mainstream says should be happening. Now, if we take into account that galactic brightness, intervening dust and gases, etc., it's fairly easy to extrapolate this version of the universe, which is the steady state constant. You can see that if we allow for some sort of uh, decrease in visibility over distance, that this one would be easily convertible into some sort of decrease over distance. Whereas trying to make this one turn into a decrease would require drastic changes because it's actually a, a quite strong increasing uh, density with time. So it is likely apparent smooth increase in the number of observable galaxies decreases with distance. That's for that for the observation to be true, then actually what the mainstream expects seems to actually to favor the concept of a steady state universe more so than one of an expanding universe. For this to hold for the expanding universe, the significant increasing trend would need to be overcome quite dramatically. So in conclusion, even if one speculates that there should be less galaxies in the distant past for an expanding universe as one seeks deeper into space and closer in time to the alleged Big Bang, my time zero does not necessarily represent such a distant past. I had a very high density at time zero. Okay, I don't want to go on. I just want to make sure I understand as well to come back to his, his argument. But basically he, what he's saying, if we can, uh, let me go back to a slide that he has here. In fact, better, the, better yet, I'll go to his paper that we have online. Again, that's on my talk, talk for today. Uh, one of the interesting things he's talking about uh, in his uh, observations of of what's going on, uh, what they're supposed to be uh, looking at. If you look at this, this is the steady state. This is just basically density, right, over time so uh, and distance. So this means pretty much you're going to find the same density of galaxies close to us and far away. And if this is an expansion, you're, if you're going to see expansion, then what you're going to have to see is you're going to have to see things closer together closer to us and further and further apart. What he says is we don't see this part of it. We don't see that closer closeness, things closer together here. Mm -hmm. And then of course we don't see um, the uh, objects being really far apart. So what they start saying is, what he said is that the, the mainstream isn't going to give up on the idea of the expanding universe. So they start trying to finagle their models so that they can't, they don't have to say, well, you know, maybe there wasn't a big bang. So uh, this is a really great paper. I think it was one of the best papers, in my opinion, from uh, this year's conference, uh, because it's uh, pretty much just doing an analysis of the data that's out there. And this is one of the things that people don't understand and people don't talk about um, uh, to uh, when, when they're uh, talking about the mainstream, and that is, well, when I talk to people who who tell who uh, find out that I'm a dissident scientist, well, a lot of times they'll say to me is they'll say, well, you know, Dave, yeah, if there's problems like this, the mainstream science is going to say, oh yeah, or universities, oh yeah, we have a problem, so therefore we got to go and take a look at it and change our theories, throw it out, whatever. That's what they expect. The main the 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 public expects that kind of thing that's going to be happening, and it doesn't doesn't happen at all in fact so um, it's just one of those uh, things where they don't look at this they don't even consider it uh, the Big Bang as he said but um, again this paper we're gonna I'm gonna include on the science woke uh, website so yes sir yeah I'm sorry about that John Otters uh, bouncing around sorry about that so if you guys have any questions <clears throat> questions that you want to ask me directly, that would be fine. Uh, last time I was talking about ether, uh, I thought maybe today I could talk a little bit about, um, since we have a smaller audience, probably, like I said, because I, I uh, sent out a video today right before this. So a lot of people say, ah, I'm not going to watch it. I just watched, uh, spent my time with Dave today. But... Um, uh, one of the things is uh, to talk about uh, the uh, Big Bang itself uh, and what sort of evidence 
one of the things that uh, is evidence against the Big Bang, and one of the reasons we we outside the mainstream talk about uh, the Big Bang being wrong, is uh, the red the idea of redshift, and redshift was one of those things that well it was the number one thing I think it was in Lowell Lowell laboratory um, observatory in Flagstaff Arizona in 1930s where um, they started talking about the redshift and what they were seeing and that someone came up with oh if it's all moving away then there must have been an explosion and the Big Bang was born uh, actually the Big Bang was a derogatory name and a lot of time people you uh, Talk, uh, I've told you that many times. So, uh, uh, but one of the things is about how do you describe what happens when you have redshift? What? Why do you have redshift? Why is it that you have um, uh, a redshift that's all around in all directions? What would be another explanation for that? Well, one of the the stories I can tell you is that in 1999. Uh, Dr. Karazani was called to give a talk at an astronomy club uh, on Long Island in New York. And it was actually a, an astronomy club that I think, I'm pretty sure that Einstein himself came by a few times in his day uh, when he was out, uh, I guess, in that area, vacationing in that area. I guess he liked to vacation uh, on the beach and stuff, but he happened to stop by at this astronomy club. Well, the story I remember, uh, he had given a talk, as Dr. Karazani, I got to see him talking with uh, other people, and they had a, a blackboard there. And uh, it was interesting because, you know, he was uh, talking about, you know, the Big Bang. He, he was uh, not a person who uh, believed the Big Bang was, was correct. And it was interesting in 1999 to find out that the astronomers who were talking with Karazani had argued away redshift for everything except for redshift between galaxies. That is, they, in the astronomy club, an amateur club, almost 20 years ago, were, all, were just ignoring the idea that there was a Big Bang at all and saying to themselves, well, we think that the reason we're seeing redshift is this, and we can explain it between stars within galaxies we're not seeing. We're still not sure how, why there's a redshift between galaxies. Um, and uh, that was extremely enlightening to me to hear that because you're always assuming that uh, you're not going to find people talking against the mainstream in, in such bold manner. And in fact, they, that's what they were doing was exactly that. They were, <clears throat> they were uh, already arguing against the, the redshift. Now, one of the reasons uh, we say that there is a redshift and there's an explanation for redshift uh, is Dr. Glenn Borkert, who talks about redshift being uh, the result of the traveling of light. And if it's light in ether, meaning the waves in ether, so if there's ether and light is uh, uh, the bashing of points. We talked about that last Friday. Uh, the ether hitting each other, the ether particles hitting each other, just like the sound waves. Well, when that happens, there is a loss of kinetic energy. There's a, you know, the energy that's, that's hit is not perfectly elastic. What is perfectly elastic means? That means when the two ether uh, particles hit each other, that they don't, uh, all the kinetic energy isn't transferred to this, the next particle. But there's a loss of kinetic energy. And believe it or not, one of the big arguments, uh, one of the problems with uh, ether is how do you explain the ability for this kinetic energy transfer between particles and ether to be able to travel, um, a, you know, 10 billion, mile, 10 billion light years and still be able to transmit something? Obviously, we lose the quality of, of the transmission of the information but it makes it that far and one of the arguments against ether has been and i'm not saying this is in my opinion it's not but mainstream uses it is that ether has to be so elastic that it's just absolutely absurd and therefore we have uh, the problem of of uh ether can't have a property it would have to be so elastic so dense so 
you know, so little loss that the the material would be just absurd. Karamba, uh, sorry about that. And uh, what happens? Uh, happen, what happened also is I think in 2017 at our CMPS conference in Vancouver at, at British Columbia, uh, uh, British Columbia, at Vancouver University, British Columbia, it turned out that uh, Ray Gallucci, while we were discussing this and we were debating this. Um, Oh, it says uh, chat disconnected. Um, hopefully, I'm still going. Yeah, I think so. All right, sometimes it does get disconnected. I've got like a three machines here. But what I was saying is that the calculations, we are talking about the difference between the particle model and the calculations and those uh, for um, transmission. So basically, let's see if I can go to my drawing board today. Let's do that. Um, oops, there it is. <laughs> okay, so let me go over here, do some drawing. So we have ether, so we're going to just do ether particles. All right, and then you have a star here. We'll even make it a color of star here. All right, and that starlight's coming to the Earth. And we've got some land on the earth. And some water on the earth. So now we know where we're at. All right, so in the ether model, what we have is we have, let's see if I can do this. I'm not sure, I've not tried this before, but let's see. Oh, don't like that. Well, that's pretty sucky. So uh, anyways, I'll just draw on it. Just forget that. Let's see if I can uh, erase that here. There we go. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Just learning how to use this. This is uh, OneNote. But basically, if this is Ether, then what you have to do is you have to say, when these hit each other, the transmission of kinetic energy has to be awfully good to go a, a total of 10 billion light years. It has to travel 10 billion years to get to Earth. So the whole thing is, is how do you calculate this? And some people were saying uh, that ether is made out of a proton and an electron. Uh, that's when one person said, or maybe it's a, a electron pair, something like that. Regardless, then what he did was he said, okay, I'm going to calculate these ether particles, and I'm going to calculate there um, to see if, in fact, given an elasticity and the distance and the time that would that be absurd and it turned out it wasn't so absurd after all that actually the these collisions could in fact transmit the information uh t from the star uh to the earth through uh, a medium so that that's pretty cool and then the thing i and i was saying well you know that's pretty bad well the particle model is a different model uh different and that is, let's see if I can do this on the same one here. So let's call these the particles and make them a different color. But they come in uh, waves, meaning so the difference here is they're one directional. They're all going this way in our model, in the particle model. The thing that makes them light is because the actual particles come in waves, and I'll make them green. They're not stuck together. They're just close together, okay? So these particles are close together, and they're traveling together at speed C. And so when those things are traveling together, and they hit you brr, 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 like that, so they're basically hitting you in groups like that instead of a steady random stream that's the particle model and now the difference is here now what you have is you have to have a particle that can survive 10 billion years so the trade-off between the particle model 
and the ether model. The ether model has to have a transmission of this light by bouncing back and forth amongst uh, an ether, whereas the particle model, these particles have to be alive, well, and kicking. If there's a half-life or something like that to them, they have to stay there and intact for um, 10 billion years. And I'm thinking, well, if they are made of subatomic, subatomic, subatomic atoms, that all of these things are parts and they're made of parts, etc., then you have the trade-off between these two. Now, if we go back to the original question, which is redshift, uh, redshift has to do with that. When this stuff is transmitted, when you see this, um, let me get a little highlighter, when we are talking about this direction, that the information and information in the form of real mass or real uh, energy, that is, the information's even be either being transmitted through kinetic energy or it's being transmitted by actual particles that come, well, those, those transmissions are imperfect. So if you start out here at 100%, Now, down here, maybe you only have 80% that's gone through, or maybe it's 8%. And I'm not talking about the brightness. I'm not saying that if it's 100% bright here, you're going to get all the sunlight here. I'm just talking about the information that's coming at us. Now, of course, there's one other thing, and that if I, if I let's look at uh, something else here. Um, Here's a star, and now it's going to have its information either in the form of collisions through ether or particles in our particle model as particles. Well, it turns out that the density, of course, you know, here is bigger and it gets smaller. So by the time you get to the Earth, by the time you get to the Earth down here, you have, oops, that's not the right color. By the time you get to the Earth, you have a lot less. And one of the interesting things is I did some calculations. Uh, according to the eye, the eye needs 60 frames a second. And um, uh, 60 frames a second gives you a steady state. Because one of the questions from uh, my best friend in, in, uh, in California, he said, well, Dave, stars, you can see pretty much, they twinkle, but they're there. And for particles to travel all the way from that star, there's so few of them that make them to your eye, you, you, you shouldn't be able to see a steady stream. Well, it turns out at the speed of C that these particles have, I, I figured out that the speed of C, that the groups of particles, that's what waves are in our model, so not one particle, but groups of them uh, are coming at you. And those groups, have a distance between from a star. Can anybody take a guess? Of course, this is like a long delay. Well, I will. Wait a minute. I'm drawing all this and you don't see the. Oh, wait a minute. OK. Are you seeing the uh, diagrams here? I swear I'm putting these out there. Hmm. Oh, that's probably because it's on delay. Let me uh, take a look here. I just want to make sure I'm not talking away here, drawing stuff, and you no know, one can see it. Because I see it on my screen here. Let me go back to it. Okay, yeah, you're seeing them. All right, sorry about that. I'll go back to your questions here. All righty, so anyways, let's, let's talk about that, uh, what this means. Well, basically, what it means is that if you have a particle model and this information is being transmitted, that is actually 5,000 kilometers between particles. So the particles that are coming from a, a, a star 
way far away. As long, if, they were, if we were to see a steady and not a twinkling, we do see a twinkling. To see its steady state, we'd have to get particles uh, coming at us at um, every 5,000 kilometers. Because you've got to remember, they're coming at us. So for us to see 60 a second, five, a space, spacing between 5,000 kilometers is going to give you a steady, steady state. All this all means is that when we go, let's go back to the uh, other one here. When we're talking about the transmission of light through space, it doesn't transmit without some type of diminishment. And whereas it, where you lose energy with the uh, ether here, that is with, with the ether, you're going to lose energy. So you can uh, think of the redshift happening there. Well, it turns out that particles that are traveling at the speed of C do not get to us in a straight line. And they, they do have a, a tendency to bunch up a little with because if they are, they don't make it from the star to us. Let's see if I can do that here. Uh, I'll just have to draw another one. They're not going to make it from the star to us in a straight line. They're going to be going this way and that way and this way. They're going to, they're not going to be a totally straight line. They'll end up, you know, again, this is totally exaggerated, but what happens with that path, what you're going to do is you're going to, if you have them in groups, these particles, well, and again, I'm making it very idealistic. But if you have the, have them in groups, well, those groups of particles are going to get to us in a way that they are not going to uh, retain the same frequency, that is the, the groupings in, in between. So there's going to be t some type of shifting going on because traveling is not for free. And that's what Glenn Borkert says. So it doesn't matter what theory you're using. It doesn't matter. It's the particle theory, an ether theory, or a lattice theory, because a lattice theory would be just different. It would just be everything is full. Just imagine space is full of stuff, and that what's traveling are spaces, sort of like beer bubbles in um, the beer bubble. I'll have to look that up and show you. I'll have to talk about the lattice theory. It's pretty cool. But even if it's a lattice theory, so it's either ether, lattice, or particle theory, they all are going to have some problems with their transmission. Okay, um, let me uh, go and see about uh, some of these questions or comments, if there's any. Uh, so, let me go back up. Let's see, uh, good, 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 some credit, quit. I'm trying to be done for me, okay. John Otter says, uh, right, I used to assume that uh, the science would change their mind if presented the evidence. And then recently, in the last couple of years, I figured that was not the case. Yeah, you're talking about whether or not uh, scientists will uh, look at evidence and, and uh, say, oh, okay, this is wrong. We, we need to take a look at this. Um, it has mostly to do with people not wanting this yet. They get into their jobs. The jobs require, they like physics. They want to get their name and they want to be an astrophysicist at MIT. So they have to jump through all the hoops and do the things or they're not allowed in. And once you get to that point to keep your job, you have to do the same thing. You can't just become a rogue scientist because then they'll drum you out. So basically they're all stuck. It's sort of, I guess, you know what, it, this is what it's sort of like. I just thought this is pretty cool. Let me uh, do this. So this is what it's like. Here, here you go. Let me uh, put. Here, here's the scientist man. Uh, better yet, let me draw one of my Miwoks. You know, this is electronic, so folks, just uh, there he is. I'm drawing and not looking at the same thing. I usually like to draw. There's, there he is, Mr. Science Guy. We'll put a diploma hat on him. There we go. And Mr. Diploma Guy, he says, hey, I've got my uh, degree. And what happens is for him to get down, uh, here's all the possibilities of, of what could be in the universe. And he needs to get over to this door over here to the university. Okay, and I'll put a tower on the university right here. 
There we go. Tree. So he's going to go over to the university. It's going to be a, oh, we'll even put like a, a dome on it with the telescope looking up. There you go. So, <laughs> this is like a pumpkin patch. <laughs> this is looking at stars, folks. Uh, maybe I can uh, do that better. But it only get worse. Now it looks like more like a pumpkin. Okay, anyways, this is the space he's got to go through. And these are all the possibilities, you know, of different things. And for him, there are stages and places he has to go. He's got to go to the class. Uh, uh, let's say this is high school. He's got to go to classes first. Then he's got to go through professors. Uh, he's got to go through some uh, theories and uh, books and that kind of stuff. And what happens if he tries to go out here, they say, nope, can't do that. you got to go here and so he's going oh well you know maybe i need to go over here and they go nope you got to go here and so these funnel you all the way down at each stage because what happens is once you get there they can't go back they're not going to go back and say i'm going to be something else or i'm going to go and and try to change things um so what normally do is that you get stuck it's almost like you go through this one-way maze where you're walking through and you get you get to a place you get stuck you can't go back and so what happens is then you get you get accumulative people along the way and they're all in their positions they all form these blocks to for you to get to your place uh, astrophysicists at MIT or the particle accelerators um, you know at Stanford linear accelerator there it is um, and you want to be in that team to be doing stuff with Stanford Linear Accelerator. Can't, and, and to get to that place, you're going to go through so many different one-way uh, um, gates. You're, and you're going to be stuck in this sort of small, small area here, right, like this, instead of coming out into the um, uh, world where you may find out that, oh, here is a problem over here. Here's some real data the data some of it's in here but some of the data is out here and some of the data is over here and you can't get at that because they just funnel you in so the whole idea is um, uh, the whole idea is uh, that you can try to get to that position but you can't get to uh, get out of it and so I think that's really what's going on that every step you go along the way you basically get yourself into a narrow and narrower place and that's where i got this uh, one email from the, guy, the the kids from tibet who talked about that um i don't know did i ever read that to you but I don't, i'll i'll see here okay let's just see um unicorn andy my nikon uh, can see dialogue framation blah, 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 from miles away that's pretty cool technology is pretty cool Question, do you know how the electric universe explains redshift? No. Do you? <laughs> um, I guess they're not uh, fans of the Big Bang, but um, if somebody knows, that's great. So uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. You know, that's one of the biggest problems we have in science is we're afraid to say we don't know. At some point, you got to have your own voice. My daddy said, come on, dude, you you lose three viewers every two you go, you you gain, I think. I don't understand that. At some point, you've got to have your own voice. My daddy said, come on, dude. Oh. Anyways, that's okay. Sometimes the things work out, sometimes they do it. Good gravy day, that looks like an ear of corn. Ha! Hey, listen, I can draw. I showed you some of my drawings, right? So I do know how to draw. It's just that uh, drawing on a tablet, basically. This is what I'm drawing on with a pen. So, uh, you know, I think if I got used to it, I'd probably get more proficient at it. But, you know, I am not. Anyways, let's uh, keep going. I guess that's that was all the questions. 
Yeah, it's a slower night tonight. And I think because, like I said, I've, I've burned all my energy up. I think I need to keep my energy for this talk where I really get in a dander and get upset because I, I really burn a lot of energy in 20 minutes from my uh, talk. So, uh, all righty. But if you guys have any questions, like I said, I can answer them for you. Uh, let me see here. Mamma Mamma Mia portfolio. Let's see if I can show you some of my, my drawings here. Yeah, I just go to dehilster.com. Oh, here's one. This is pretty cool. Well, There's one of my uh, wife. There's some reflections there. I, I apologize. Uh, this was taken through glass because I have it it's from 1990. It's a pencil drawing of my wife live sitting in front of me. Let me, uh, I think there's some, this is a pretty neat one. It's a self-portrait laying down. 1987. Oh my goodness. Let's see if I have some more drawings here. Um, sketches. There's some study of feet. You got to really know how to draw feet, all those kinds of things. Uh, you can see all the muscles, all the tendons, all that kind of stuff. And Oh, hey, wait, you can see my face taking a picture of this. That's pretty bizarre. So, yeah, I do do some art. I know uh, Lisa does some, too. So, sketches, that kind of thing. Anyways, those are some it. Then I have some more abstract ones. I think I've shown some of this stuff before. That's a pretty cool one. I don't know if I, it gets any closer than that. Probably not. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's Rio de Janeiro, in fact. If you know, there's the Christ on the Mountain there, right here. There's a uh, sugar loaf, the moon, some of the uh, buildings and stuff like that. So, pretty cool when I went into abstract. So yeah, my drawings uh <laughs> pretty bad when I sketch. But I do I actually I can sketch pretty quickly as long as I can watch I have to watch with my arm my my uh face my uh pen is going. So questions, let me see down here. Okay. No, the electric units are not a fan of the Big Bang. But I don't know how they explain red, red shift. That's why I'm asking you. Okay. Um, you know, my guess is they're going to end up coming up with something. I mean, you know, I, I, be, I believe even while Thornhill has come up with his electric explanation of gravity. Um, so, of course, they are looking for that. So they're going to be predisposed to trying to find a force that's gravitational. Uh, that would be explained by electric fields or charge or whatever. And, of course, my my question always to them is, what is an electric field? It can't be magical. So, uh, Lisa, yes, and I've watched uh, your doco, supposed to say a documentary, uh, and do have a Wacom tab. I use it for designing advertisements. Yeah, this is like for my daughter and wanted to do some, I don't remember, so it's really bad. It's like cheapo Wacom or Wacom, however you say them. So what do you mean by physicality, Proto-X? Um, what it means is that there are no forces in the universe that are not caused by some type of mass. That's, that's it. Now, whether or not it's a light being transmitted like th through a medium and a kinetic energy, uh, you can't have magical forces. You can't have an electric field that's not made of something. Nothing, there is no force in the universe that can be Im imp uh, imposed without a push. In fact, you gotta really think a lot about it. I think I have an, a, a real early um, video on this, but Pushing is the only thing that can happen in the universe. Even when I do a pull, here it is. See, here's the uh, one of these adapters, right, for uh, 
or chargers. If I'm what I call pulling it toward me, let's do it sideways. If I'm pulling this toward me, I'm not pulling it toward me. I'm pushing it. So no matter what you do, there are no such things as pulls or attractions. There are only pushes. So physicality means that in the end, if there's any type of force, or what we even call energy, which is a um, concept, that the, that is caused by something physical. The world in universe is physical. Everything in the world is universe and physical. So in the electric universe, if they say, well, no, there's a field and there's a fundamental field, well, what's that fundamental mental field made of? And um, in the two, in the three main competing theories right now, the archetypes of the theories, ether, particle, and, and, and lattice, we are all looking at a um, uh, transmission or uh, of, of fee everything being made physical. And each of those models uh, tries to do that. Uh, in those models who subscribe to infinity, like um, Borkert's ether and our particle model, um, there's always something below it that helps the helps it move. You can't have, for instance, light bend into a rainbow without some force actually hitting it. So in the particle model, going to my drawing again, let's see here. There we go. Let's get it out for you. Okay, in the particle model, we have light. And here's light. These are G1 particles, and they're all going at C. They're all traveling in this direction, all together. Everything's traveling together at speed C. Then it hits a prism. And because these are really small, it just goes through it. Um, just imagine, you know, like uh, uh, these are subatomic particles. So subatomic particles are smaller than atoms, so they can go right through them. But what happens is this splits up into a rainbow. And this is totally wrong. So these are absolutely arbitrary colors. Okay, so a physical universe, what's physicality? Well, light's physical in this case. They are waves of particles. Here's a wave of particles coming at you. Here's the next wave of particles coming at you. Here's the next wave of particles coming at you. And that, in our model, causes light. So the frequency, of course, is how... That's the frequency. I'll just do this. Those are the frequency here and here. That's a frequency. When it comes here, these G1 particles, what we call them, they're named after gravitons because this is a gravitonic model. Everything can be described in Newton's gravity. The entire universe can be described that way. So these G1 particles are coming in here. When they get here, there are G2 particles. That is Imagine this, these are really small. We can't, we can't see the particles themselves. We see the results of the particles. We don't see the particles themselves. And so we see, we see the results. These are super small. They're just absolutely teeny weeny. And what happens is when they come here, these go in this direction and these go in this. And I'm curving them just to make a point. They're going in different directions. They're coming in at, at this angle here. I'll do this. They're coming in here at this angle, and then they're coming out in different angles here. So what happens is, is that you have a force that causes this particle to, from a straight line to move over here. And how does that work? Well, I'll draw another picture. Here's a giant G1 particle. Imagine it's like a big earth, okay? 
and this is just space now because you have like um, somewhere this is this is just a line of demarcation the atoms and the G1 particles going around that this is going to be pretty much empty so this is the the how do you say the edge of the glass but there's nothing there it's actually just completely empty space although we see a, an edge so we're way down this is a G1 particle in our model okay again this is, has to do with physicality now this is going in this direction let's make it green it's going in this direction in this line but what happens in ref in, in actually in uh, dispersion is that we in dispersion only happens in a triangle it doesn't happen in a rectangle we can explain that as well in our model but what happens here is for this guy to change what happens See, I'm getting better. I'm starting to like wanting to make these not such a mess. What are these? These are G2 particles. So as the same as that the G1 particles keep the Earth in line, G2 particles, another level down in the infinite levels, and I'll draw that G2, are just traveling in all different directions, just like G1 particles. G1 particles are shot out throughout the universe by suns. And that's an, that, that, that ends up being gravity and light. If it comes in waves, it's light. If they're released in waves, it's light. If they're released randomly, it's just, it ends up being gravity. We don't see any signal, no light. Well, what happens is the G1 particle, which is one particle, this G1 particle, which is one particle out of lots of G1 particles from this other these are the G1 particles here. These G1 particles are coming at the prism. That's the line here that we can't see. These are, okay? And then down here, this G1 particle, if you come really close to it, there's just this is just the frontier of where the glass will start. Inside here are uh, nucleons. But what causes, in the end, this is a nucleon, say, that's a nucleus of, of an atom. What happens here is things that cause this G1 particle to move is a G2 particle that's going to hit it. So fields in our model gravitational fields uh, electric fields are a little different but the gravitational fields are basically a bunch of particles it's just like a graviton shooting in all directions and what causes the light to bend it's not space-time the light to bend white light to bend and then end up with different colors here that means this G1 particle has to start curving if it starts curving, it has to have a force to do that. If it has a force to do that, they're G2 particles. Because as it gets closer to this, this particle, the, the nucleon, there are, G, there are G2 going all over. And they create the shadowing effect. And the shadowing effect cr uh, causes gravity. So long story short, in our model, for instance, we have the G1 particle, which, which one particle is not light but lots of them together are below that one level down way below it traveling at you know how fast g2 particles go at c squared whoa that is fast and that c squared when it hits the g1 can make those g1 particles sustain uh, a c uh, the speed of c and so 
what happens is in the universe physicality has to come from something and in our model it has to come literally from a kinetic energy from another uh, particle in this case we have particles down a level the g2 particles are hit by g3 particles are hit by uh, they're different, yeah. What we, no particle is exactly the same. No two electrons are the same. No two G1 particles are the same. No G2 particles are the same. No nucleon is the same. The atomic structure of nucleons, which is a periodic table below our periodic table, all those things are most likely different. And the differences, that's, you know, but that gives you an idea. Everything has physicality. Um, yes, I watched. Okay, okay, we'll go back. Uh, that's a great kind of thing. Difficult uh, shadows and things. Artwork, love the picture. Yeah, okay. Sorry to hear. So your theory has forces basically filled with particles. Am I understanding? Not probably. No, basically everything's a particle because everything is um, mass. And those particles uh, uh, organize themselves by uh, gravitational fields. At our level of the universe, it's the G1 field. What G1 is the graviton, it's the photon, it's the electron, and it's also the particle for electricity. It's also the particle for magnetic fields. It's all the same particles. They're all going C. Uh, that gives you a clue that it's probably all the same particle and we can actually describe the universe that way meaning the all of them going around from all the suns being shot out create a um, there's space it's not like everything's made up I guess the part maybe at least your understanding is that oh they're particles like the particles that make up this pen well yes and no there are free flowing particles just like we have gas versus solids um, that's the same thing. So gravity is like a gas of particles. Um, uh, nucleon, the nucleus of an atom, is like uh, the Earth or a solid thing. And that's made out of a whole di different lower level of periodic table of, you know, who knows what kinds of atomic structure they are. But you can describe the whole universe that way. Uh, the way we look at atoms, as you can imagine, just... Uh, you know, the sun is a nucleon. Um, the planets are G1 particles going around it. And if electricity is a G1 particle that's flowing through a wire, well, imagine lining up all these suns in a row. And, um, oh, I've got pages here. Yeah, so what you do is you put a sun here, 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 a sun here. And here comes, uh, let's call it a comet, here. And it's going to go through here. Hello. It may flow through. It may not be a perfectly mm -hmm. straight path, but it'll flow through that. Um, if, a, if, a, if, a, if something comes in, gets too close, it'll get into orbit. If another thing could come in. Uh, another particle could coming in here, hit it, become absorbed. This becomes bigger. Um, another one could come in and hit it and just simply impart a force on it. So with all those kinds of things in the particle model, we can pretty much describe everything we see in the universe. So far, we've not been able to find something we can't describe with that kind of uh, model. So in this case, there could be suns, but it's the, the difference between, for instance, our solar system. If we were to look at our our unicosm of the, you know, we call it, uh, Borker calls it a unicosm. Unicosm is sort of our area, our, our level of the infinity. Um, you know, if we look around us in all the galaxies and stuff, it looks like we're more of a gas kind of environment. Whether or not we're a barium atom, like some people have said that this, our solar system is a barium atom. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, it could be an atomic structure that's a part of a chair and a or somebody sneeze, you know, 40 levels up. It sounds weird, but, uh, you know, who knows? But the idea, again, it's all physical. Question, is it not possible that fields, electronic, are abstraction for macroscopic, 
macroscopic ex uh, effect of scale, microscopic pattern, and rational cause? Good question. And the answer is uh, emphatically no, in my opinion. Um, basically, I think what you're trying to say, Pro X, is, is, is it not possible that fields, electric and magnetic or gravitational, are, are abstraction from macroscopic, meaning they, it's something bigger you, you, I can't think of how that could logically be. You can't have, it's magic in just some sense. It's like what you're saying is, it, it, what I would say to your answer in modern terms, Proto X, is that infinity. And that is everything below us and everything above us affects us. So yes, um, if you see in this diagram here, um, I can, there you go. If you see in this diagram here, these affect the path of this. And so, yeah, but the, the, the reason this, this goes in these paths is because there is a field there and that field consists of something. So the answer to your question is absolutely no. If you are a person who believes in sort of, uh, uh, or subscribes to infinity and you don't believe for at action at a distance. If you believe in action at a distance, which in, in my opinion is totally magic, then you can talk about what you talk about. But no, the answer is emphatically no. You can't have uh, something that's an abstraction from it. You can say that and talk about it, and you can draw, you can make incredibly accurate, um, functional, not accurate, but functional equations to do calculations to cr uh, create circuits, to create the magnet magnetic fields that you need to do whatever you need to do. You can create all that and you can subscribe it to the surroundings and not have to deal with what it is. But in the end, I think the average human being says, that's nice, but tell me what it is. It's a real force. When I put a magnet and this thing attracts, it attracts really hard. People are going to go, there's something going on there. It's not an abstraction. So that would be my answer to you, Proto X. And uh, I know Draft Science who loves me. I don't know if you're here, Draft Science, but um, I, I thought, I think I can, I've almost figured out which one you are because I know you're a big fan. So, um, uh, and, uh, and I know you, I mentioned speaking Portuguese was something you didn't like so uh, uh, yeah, that's that's a valid the other the other statements and how you say it you know you have a different style that's for sure but I appreciate you talking about me no matter what good or bad because I get my subscribers and get get more critical thinkers in my direction so cool how to describe real macroscopic interaction at a distance like two magnets attracting each other those effects are useful and we need to describe it at some point uh, yeah, we do, but in the end, those of us who want to technically control gravity, to technically go faster than the speed of light, to technically transmit information faster than the speed of light, to technically take sunlight or G1 particles and nucleons, and instead of having to go mine things, create things, the old alchemy problem, we're not going to do that if we keep just treating things as mathematical. If we don't get to the physical, technology won't advance to those places that we see and we make up in the movies. It ain't going to happen. So the idea that if we just stick to the abstraction and not really know what's going on, we're not going to be also, very good question, Proto X, and I'm going to go to another drawing here. Hey, this is, gets better as the time, uh, even though I've only got half the people today. But I've got the best half, don't I? <laughs> Let's take a look at um, the magnetic field. And we were talking about, okay, here we go. Here's a circuit. Electronic circuit, okay? I think this is a battery. I don't know. This is going to be a battery. And this these are going to be parallel resistors. This is a circuit. Now you don't have to know anything really too much about it. You don't have to be an electrical en engineer, 
But um, basically, two resistors, what happens? Well, you have a flow, you have a flow of G1 particles coming this way. Okay? Electricity, I'm going to just use our particle model. They're flowing. And the number here, let's call them 10, only 8 are going to get through. And then over here you have 12, and only 4 of them will get through. Well, it turns out that when you put parallel resistors together, funny things happen. They don't act exactly the same. You would think they would. It turns out that my father, who's an electrical, electrical engineer all his life, I'm going to draw some thinner lines here. Mm, I'm going to have to draw them again. There's the two resistors. What happens is, because we say that um, electricity are G1 particles, and we say that these are particles, we have particles going around the parallel resistors. Particles. And they're also the same particle as electricity. Turns out that my father, who was an electrical engineer in this setup of parallel resistors, they could never give a physicality in the fact that these don't act exactly the same. There was no reason for it. There is no explanation. The only explanation you get is if you have a new model like ours that says, guess what? G1 particles, electricity, doesn't exist only within the wires. In fact, a battery holds a lot of its quote unquote electrical charge it holds outside the battery because you can measure in a compass you can measure you can measure the electric field by compasses around the battery so if that's the case then what you have are G1 particles that are part of the battery, that are used in a battery, that are outside the battery. You're holding it here, and they're flowing outside of it. Now you say, that's crazy. Okay, here's my phone. Here's a charger. It's a wireless charger. How does that work? Well, that's what we're saying. There's a physicality that in, a, in this case of the parallel resistors in this draw, these drawings, we're finding out that having a model for the, elect, the magnetic field around these explains things that we can't explain. And the model works really well. And my father, who's over 40 years, super brilliant guy in, in electronics, always in research, always coming up with new... Um, technical ways, new circuits, new digital circuits. He was always, you know, top at his, in his field. Turns out that he's using, we're using the particle model and he's going crazy. He's going, you know, Dave, this explains why my glasses are always tilted. This explains um, why uh, parallel resistors work the way they do. So that answers your question, Proto X, about the idea that. Um, uh, it's it's useful to have those things, but it's not always useful because we don't have the explanation to everything. And until we buck up, until we become strong and say to ourselves, we got to come up with new models and we got to make physicality for this, then we will start to get answers and better explanations of what was really going on. And there you go. So I hope that sort of answers a question. Hey, I'm delighted that I understood that the question that I uh, and I did have to go over it a few times. I have to go now, but thanks for everything. No problem. 
particle outside the conductor looks a lot ori original like the, the ORS model. Have you seen it? Ors no, I haven't. I haven't seen that. Oersted model, I guess. No, I have not. Uh, something I should look up. Let me see. Oersted's law. Like the right hand rule. Is that what it means? The magnetic field lines encircle uh, current carrying wire. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, though all those things, we have to look at the flows in our particle model, how that works. The really interesting one is the right hand rule. Why does that exist? And one of the reasons we think is because, this is real interesting, at least it is to me. Not sure it is. Tonight's a slow night, huh? I've got a captive audience, or one that's uh, doing you know, multitasking, I'm sure, because, uh, like I said, my energy level today is... But uh, let's take a right-hand rule. So we have a wire real close to the wire here. And um, what it turns out that... Mm, gosh darn it, see, it doesn't draw all the time. So it turns out that that the structure of the the nucleons within metals uh, causes when what we believe is just like the layout of the nucleons. I like to make them look like stars because then people can get the idea of our gravitonic model. Again, this is totally, this isn't real, but the idea is, and that is, what happens is, is when you have these, the structure of metals is very, very unique because it allows for uh, G1 particles that go around nucleons in our model. That is, here's a nucleon, and then we have G1 particles that go all around it, lots of them. Okay, and here's the nucleon. All right. Well, this is a stable, a pretty stable situation. You have another one, and the flows between atoms keep them together. That these these flows of these G1 particles, but because of the way uh, metals are set up, they set up a path through metal atomic structure, and once we hack into the way the atom really is made up. We're going to find out why, in fact, it causes spiraling. <clears throat> and the spiral happens to be the right-hand rule. And it's all physical. It's an all-physical setup of the physicality of where these things are. The G, you know, again, imagine these are suns. You can, you, if you were to take all the universe and all the suns and put them in certain places and put lots of stuff around them, you could make them really stable. And that stability then uh, then would set up paths that are very stable themselves. And some paths will be straighter than others, and that's better conductors. Some paths will cause spiraling more than others, and that's where you get right-hand rules. And so those are the kinds of, uh, of interesting things. So I'm not sure. Particle solid conductor look a lot like that. So yeah. Okay. We're in an hour and a half of me joining on with five people. Um, I know there's not been a lot of questions. And of course, I've been also uh, not my stellar amazing music. I got it all out uh, late, uh, earlier today in my other video. I want to take a look at that. Um, but hopefully some of this will be uh, interesting to you guys who have been sticking around. I know last time, my goodness, we had you know, up to 13, 14, 15 people at a time. Right now we're just around five or six. And like I said, I think it's because if I get a video out and I, I learn my lesson, you gotta try things, uh, that actually uh, turns out that if I send a video on the same day, then people aren't gonna come to the, uh, necessarily gonna come to the live, the live action and ask questions. But the good thing is, is that, 
you know, the value I can see in this is that when you ask questions, if you are here, I can give you answers that you're not going to hear anywhere else. You're also going to get answers of some of hanging around with for 20 or 30 years, some of the best minds outside of physics. I mean, great minds. A lot of them have passed on because I started this in early 90s is when I started hanging out with all these amazing people. And unfortunately, even my mentor's 98. I haven't heard that he's gone on, but we haven't talked in a while. But, um, you know, all the things I've learned and uh, he instilled in me are all still here. And answers that come up, come up from getting questions over decades and starting to really think about what are what are the answers that we as a community have so uh anyways i'll tell you you want to read a great book read this I'll, I'll give you just a little bit of uh insight into this let me see i'm gonna have to turn a light on here uh there we go i'll read you some passages here this is a guy um uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander Unsiger, if you don't know who he is. He is a physicist from Germany. And he wrote this book, The Higgs Fake, How Particle Physics Fooled the Nobel Co Committee. He's writing this. This was in, in 2013. This is pretty interesting. He said um, in the preface, here's something I highlighted here. Einstein, Dirac, and Schrodinger would have considered this discovery of the Higgs particle ridiculous it is is sure that's for sure they would never have been, have believed such a complicated model with dozens of unexplained parameters uh to reflect anything fundamental at all so uh, and the guy just lay off he says therefore i shall be very explicit in this book it is written for the young scholar who wants to dig into the big questions of physics Rather than dealing with the the blend of mythology and technology, basically he's saying there that the uh, boson, the the large, uh, uh, the large hadron collider, is uh, a technology dealing in mythology. So that's pretty sad. There's no way to convince an expert that he or she uh, has done nonsense for the last thirty years pretty neat pretty neat Here, here's another uh, I've just in the beginning started to put some quotes I've read through it again but I'm starting to highlight things that I like here uh, the to make intelligent people do stupid things it takes particle physics wow hey hey Unsiger I'm gonna use that I'm gonna put it in a meme from the Higgs fake that is an absolutely great meme so Alrighty, um, I still got some people here. I, yeah, it looks like it. Um, so any more questions, anything, or I may just uh, end it here since, again, my enthusiasm level isn't holding people on. So, um, yeah, it really makes a difference, doesn't it? Any more questions? Bro, the X, Lisa's gone. There's five people. Hey, maybe you're there still. Um, draft science. Again, I appreciate you sending people my way all the time. Put whatever you want in front of my name. So, no problem. Um, alrighty, folks. Then I'm going to just head off if I'm just getting no questions at all. Um, yeah, like I said, it's been a little slower tonight. Usually peaks like 15 or so, but it's 8 tonight. Uh, again, if I don't hear anybody chit-chatting, then uh, I'll just uh, head on my way. And I appreciate you guys coming out. Hopefully uh, next time I'll be sure not to. Uh, when will you comment more about experiments? What kind of experiments, Proto-X? Absolutely. Hey, there's one. I know it takes some time. So, um, 
Ask me the experiment, and I will tell you about it. Qual experiencia, cara? Qual me fala? Hey, everybody. Just uh, here, uh, winding down in our last uh, 25 minutes. <clears throat> Hope you looked at my video that I put out today. It's, it's quite fun. But um, ProX is asking me what will care about experiments. Oh, you mean maybe like the uh, Andrea Cis experiments? Is that what you're talking about? I need to do that. You know, that's not a bad thing for me to do next Friday is to prepare those things and do them live and talk about them. That would be pretty cool. Maybe I can even get Andrea Cis to be here. Yeah, about physics in general. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, the reason I what I would say is um, the physics, um, you know, in general... I always look at the physicality of things. So, yeah, I have a set of his stuff. I have his stuff here. Where do you go? Right here. And for those of you who don't know, we don't read Portuguese, Correios. That means um, mail. Yeah, I've got all kinds of stuff in here. My goodness. With this, with cement inside. It's got this on it. And I've got these guys. I mean, he made all this stuff. I owe him. So there you go. Uh, yeah, I will do these. Next time, we will look at these experiments and talk about them. Because... Again, it's not so much of what we, you know, just coming up with a traditional explanation. We're going to, uh, I use the particle model, and we'll describe things using a particle model um, and say, this is really what's happening. This is what the electric field is, etc. So, alrighty. I saw the vid you did when you sent that box. Yeah, I know. I'm owing him so big time. Yeah, I got to go through his book. Um, right here. Experimental and Historical Foundations Electricity. Let me put a light on here. There you go. And basically look at the fundamentals of stuff. And it'll be really interesting because we do have, um, let's see if I can find one with one of the apparati. Oh, here's one. So we'll do this one maybe. I think I'll do this one. So right here you have a apparatus which is a sort of like a po uh, a poster, uh, a straw with a piece of cardboard with something hanging on it that gives you a, a sort of a detector of static electricity. And um, I will go through those and do them one at a time. Um, what I can do is make a video of it, but maybe we can actually do it in these and then people will come to these and see what's going on. We'll talk about one of them, in, at least uh, in the video, and see what we can talk about it. Hey, Jesse, thank you for coming. So um, if you have some more questions, I can hang around until 11 o'clock. And um, I appreciate everybody coming by. It's been a slower day. I know it really just depends on the day, too. But uh, I do appreciate everybody coming here. Like I said, I, I really have different answers from other people. So I think a lot of it, you know, my goal is to really show and give people answers like we don't know or there are different models that can explain it. And a lot of times our questions actually have to be reworded or we have to understand what's wrong with the question because it's got implications of it that aren't going to um, fit in the more modern view of what's going on with the universe. So... But no more questions. I um, think then maybe we'll head off.
Uh, my, like I said, I've, I do I do apologize. My energy level isn't there today. I'm sort of relaxed because I did a video just before this. I'm going to make a video. Maybe I'll shoot it off before this one, or maybe I shoot it about after this one. The problem is, is when I get my ranker up, it seems like you know once I do that, I relax a lot. I am calm. Just trying to think. Oh, what I could do is I'll read you something. Um, okay, Protonex. Yeah, I'll, I'll save that for later. Okay, Jesse. See you later. Protonex. Ciao for now. Muito obrigado. Um, if you, I'll, I'll give you one minute. And if you have any questions, Jesse, if not, you just sort of hung in here. I'm going to be heading out. So, um, not a lot of questions. A lot of times if there are more questions as well. I'm usually stimulating people's questions if I'm all enthusiastic about stuff. And if I'm not, then then that's sort of the, the result. So, uh, boa noite, gente. See what else I have here. Anything? Pretty much. All right. Ciao for now. Hey, that's the uh, spelling for Italian. All right, guys. We will see you. Uh, sorry for the lower energy tonight. I do appreciate people coming by. Uh, hopefully there'll be some interesting stuff here. And uh, we'll see you next Friday. And I will tr definitely next Friday I will prepare the experiments. And I will actually make sure I put that on the um, meme on the uh, graphics for next time. And I'll look through this and perform an experiment and try it out before I get to you and then we'll talk about it and then I'll explain it to you in the mo particle model how that works. Buon noite. And I always say and I always end up in this way stay critical, stay thinking, don't believe everything that I say or anyone else. Uh, think for yourself, think critically, become science woke. Ciao for now. <laughs>